What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and since by now I've not only graduated, but even really finished up with all of my summer obligations as well, I have been reading quite a bit more than I usually do. All of this free time that I now suddenly have has to go somewhere, and I haven't really been able to connect with any Netflix shows or anything like that, so if I want to avoid mindlessly surfing around social media, I basically have to be reading something. At the time of rewriting this script, I've actually just finished a non-karate related book, Underground by Haruki Murakami, which is a series of interviews about the 1995 Tokyo gas attacks. Fun stuff. However, when it comes to more karate related books, I'm somewhat ashamed to admit that I'm mostly running out of new material. Almost all of the written material about karate in English is to put it mildly, aimed at a different target audience than me. I have found quite a number of style handbooks, most of which are aimed at potential beginner students. These books mostly tend to have written descriptions or sometimes photos of techniques that I've already learned, maybe the first kata or two in a style that I haven't yet practiced, and even more occasionally, an unsourced biography of a style's founder. Sometimes those bios do contain a bit of interesting information, but a lot of them also repeat myths about karate's history that have long since been disproved and abandoned by higher rank practitioners or by karate researchers. The best remaining karate books that I haven't yet read are in Japanese, and those ones take a little bit longer to read and process. In fact, I do actually have a few projects in the works that relate to reading and then presenting the content of these kind of books. But even these types of sources can be very hard to access, mainly because most of them are out of print, and on top of the premium prices that I'd have to pay in order to get them as collector's items, I'd also have to spend additional money that I don't have trying to import them. I'm still going to, of course, but it might take a while. One of the key things that I always try and keep in mind when I'm researching karate, or anything for that matter, is that I have my own personal biases as to what information I'm willing to accept. If I'm not able to recognize those biases, then I might accidentally end up blinding myself to what could be a very useful perspective. Additionally, even if someone's interpretation of karate or kata is just absolutely factually wrong, which is a pretty rare occurrence, but it does happen, there's usually still something to be learned by considering how they could have come to having that perspective. I've also been trying to get in touch with real professional karate researchers as well, you know, just to keep my perspective a little bit more balanced. I say all of this up front because in this video I'm going to be criticizing a specific researcher's opinions about kata techniques. That researcher is Giles Hopkins, and this video was largely inspired by his book on Suparimpe, which I picked up on pre-order the day that it came out and read in about three days, mostly while I was traveling. I very much respect Mr. Hopkins, and there's even a slight chance that he ends up watching this video, so I want to be clear that I'm embarking on this critique out of a deep admiration for his work. As I'll be getting into, his framework of kata analysis is by and large, in my opinion, fundamentally correct, but for this one slight issue that I'm going to point out. I hope that by offering my opinion, I can help people to think more deeply about kata and the techniques contained therein and give a little bit more of my perspective on the parts of kata analysis that I kind of glossed over in my recent How We Got Kata videos. I hope that everybody enters this video with an open mind and comes out of it thinking more deeply about this topic, even if they completely disagree with me about my conclusions. And to Mr. Giles Hopkins, if you're in the audience, thank you immensely for your ongoing work, and I hope that my voice can add something of value to your amazing accomplishments. Now. Without further ado, let's get into it. Like almost 100% of martial arts nowadays, and even a vast majority of historical ones, karate was never really meant for military use, but instead for civilian life. Leaving aside outliers like Krav Maga and the Yoroi Kumiuchi parts of Japanese jujitsu, most martial arts were supposed to be used by individuals to defend themselves in their day to day life at least when they weren't intended to be used in sports contests. There is some evidence to suggest that karate, or at least Kei, was primarily trained by the aristocracy of the Ryukyu kingdoms, but 
This practice really only flourished after the Three Kingdoms had been unified, when true military engagements were much fewer and further between, and those aristocrats generally served as more of a police force than as an army. We also shouldn't forget that those aristocrats also had weapons training. While the majority of weapons were kept within Shuri Castle, and there were, at various points, some degrees of bans on private weapon ownership, these stockpiled arms could be, and in fact were, distributed to warriors in times of need. As the Motoburi lineage can attest, swords, bows and arrows, spears, and even the occasional firearm were the stock and trade of the warrior caste. Military martial arts exist in a particular space. Because you're likely to be using these skills on the battlefield against similarly armed opponents, weapon versus weapon techniques were given prominence. The only real situation where you as a warrior would be expected to be using unarmed techniques is if you had been disarmed, and in that situation the general pattern was that you would try and prevent your own death or incapacitation, and pick up your own weapon as soon as possible. Unlike karate, military martial arts tend to focus less on striking and longer, more drawn-out engagements, and more on quick grappling techniques and minimizing damage. This actually should start to ring some bells for us historians, since, as we know, while the true aristocracy were the primary practitioners of Te, the Chinese techniques that were known as Todi, which arguably became much more of the basis for karate than Te did, primarily gained their foothold among the upper middle class of wealthy merchants, as opposed to within the castle walls. So with all of that in mind, let's begin to talk about Giles Hopkins and his method of kata analysis. Mr. Hopkins has published three books, two of which I own in their physical copies, and for our purposes here, I'll be starting with The Kata and Bunkai of Gojuryu Karate. Published in 2018, this book in many ways served as a formative experience in my own journey of setting out to think more deeply about karate. On page 237, Appendix A, Hopkins gives some of his thoughts on the principles of kata analysis, many of which are quite similar to the Kaisai no Genri, as my viewers will no doubt be able to recognize. I'm going to give just a very brief paraphrase of most of these so that you can see the similarity. Katas are composed of combinations or sequences of techniques. Combinations start with a block or receiving technique. Keep in mind the principles of stance and weight shifting. The turns and steps of kata have meaning. Block the hands, defend against elbows, and attack the head. Techniques should depend on mechanics, not merely strength or speed. Each combination should be continuous. Accurately analyze how a real attacker would respond. The final posture is less telling than how you get there. Do the bunkai exactly as it's performed in the kata. As you can see, these aren't all the same points as the kaisai no genni, and the explanations of each point, which I've left out of this video for time, add a lot more to his theory. It would seem, based on a perusal of Mr. Hopkins' books, that he was either not aware of the fact that the Toguchi lineage of Goju had arrived at a very similar theory, or at the very least that he arrived at his own theory separately from Toguchi and his students, which supports my personal supposition that the principles of kata analysis can largely be reasoned inductively from studying the kata themselves. However, it's also entirely possible that I'm just completely wrong, and that Mr. Hopkins was fully aware of the Kaisai no Genni. After all, he demonstrates a deep familiarity with almost every modern lineage of Goju, including Toguchi's line. Either way, as a fan of the one theory, I naturally find the other to be incredibly useful and valuable. In his analysis of each combination of techniques, Giles Hopkins deals with three discrete segments. The blocking or receiving technique, the bridging technique, and the finishing technique. With regards to that finishing technique, which is meant to put an end to the conflict, and also to the structure of this part of the kata in general, he writes in the introduction to the kata and bunkai, When looked at in this way, the techniques are more deadly, more effective, which is, of course, the whole point of a martial art. Four words in that quote really stand out to me. Giles Hopkins is equating a technique being more deadly to it therefore being more effective. Because of this proposed identity, it's unclear whether he's saying that the point of a martial art is its effectiveness, or its deadliness, though that ambiguity is somewhat moot if you believe that deadliness equals effectiveness. And I would certainly agree with the point that martial arts should be effective for whatever that's worth. But 
as I mentioned at the beginning of this segment, karate is not, fundamentally speaking, a military art. And for that reason, I don't agree that the finishing techniques of kata sequences ought to be deadly. And that seemingly very simple disagreement has some serious implications for how Mr. Hopkins interprets certain techniques when compared to my own interpretations. So first, what constitutes a lethal technique? Well, here's a question that seems simple if ever there were one. A lethal technique is a technique that results in the death of its recipient, right? Well, not exactly. Very few martial artists or medical professionals put much faith in the old idea of delayed death touch techniques anymore. However, they were a large part of Chinese medicine and martial arts theory for some time if certain documents are to be believed. When I read through Patrick McCarthy's translation of the Bubishi, I noticed a few things about these supposed delayed death touch techniques that really piqued my interest. In Article 21, which is the article concerned with the delayed death touch, there are a number of mentioned techniques which cause death in anywhere from two hours to one month, although there are a few outliers, such as the memorable death before a person can even take seven steps and death within three years. Now, I'm sure that my outlook on this is somewhat biased by the fact that McCarthy chose to use modern medical terminology when translating this section, but to me, the descriptions of location of attack and the length until death have led me to suspect that the delayed death touch might actually have something to it. I personally am not really fully convinced by key or chi theory, but I'm also aware that internal injuries can fester and re-traumatize and eventually kill their sufferers. And I somewhat suspect, in the pre-surgical society that produced the bubishi, these types of injuries, which generally require surgery to correct them, were the methods utilized by the delayed death touch to kill its victims. For example, an untreated arterial hemorrhage would, based on the little medical knowledge that I have, potentially take a little bit of time before it killed someone. So, if we accept that sort of delayed effect, the definition of a lethal technique doesn't technically have to render an attacker immediately deceased. But what about incapacitation? Here, I would make the argument that if your goal in a fight really was to kill an opponent, knocking them out would be more than likely able to serve that purpose. Once you've knocked someone out, you can then proceed to do whatever sort of thing you'd like to render them more, let's say, permanently unconscious, such as choking them out, or even retrieving a weapon to do your dirty work. In fact, you could probably achieve the same result through significant leg injury, which renders them unable to run away, or even by causing them a non-fatal lung injury, which would make it more painful and difficult to breathe, also preventing them from escaping. All of these considerations could mean that, even if we do accept the idea that these techniques were supposed to be lethal, your finishing technique, as shown in the kata, doesn't itself have to do the job of ending your opponent's life, merely that it has to do the job of ending the fight. Now, I honestly don't believe that most of the fights of the nature that spawned karate were fights to the death, although undoubtedly some of them were, and also some of them that weren't supposed to be to the death ended up turning out like that. I mean, most street fights don't end in death nowadays, so there's not really a reason that I can find to suspect that they used to in the past. But what I've hopefully demonstrated in this section is that even if your goal was to kill your opponent in a civilian combative situation, you wouldn't necessarily have to rely on your empty-handed techniques as shown in the kata in order to do so. With that out of the way, since Giles Hopkins is operating under the assumption that the final technique of any given kata sequence ought to be lethal, rather than what I would call conclusive, his analysis of certain movements overlooks what are, in my opinion, much more likely interpretations. In his analysis of the ending sequence of Saifa, which in that analysis starts with the foot sweep and hammer fist techniques, he isn't content to interpret the straight punch towards the back, which is the one that directly precedes the final turn and mawashiuke, as a punch. Instead, 
He views it as a further head-twisting motion, and the final turn as representing a neck break. As a brief aside, it is, all things considered, actually fairly difficult to snap a human's neck. Gallows, back when that's how death sentences were usually carried out, were supposed to snap the condemned's neck at the end of their fall, hence the raised platform and trap door, and could require as many as eight feet of a drop in order to do so. While suffocation by the noose served as a secondary safety measure in order to ensure that the condemned was actually executed, the goal of hanging was to produce a hangman's fracture in the spine, which is very gross and I highly recommend that you don't look it up. In general, it took between about 1,000 and 1,200 pounds of force to ensure a fracture, which was not always achieved even with these methods. Now, it is technically possible for humans to produce such force, although the only research that I could find on it mentioned punches and not neck cranks, but it takes an immense amount of training and is also often unreproducible outside of really tightly controlled conditions. If a neck is such a difficult thing to snap, as all of the data would suggest, why assume then that so many goju techniques were designed to be neck cranks or neck snaps? I think that Mr. Hopkins' desire to find a lethal finishing technique in there coupled with the fact that those statistics about neck snapping aren't really all that common knowledge, led him to see neck cranks where there really were none. I mean, I only really learned that snapping someone's neck wasn't really feasible after I did some research on BJJ neck cranks, and had to specifically learn the forces that were required to perform that dirty deed for dirt cheap as part of my research for this script. Additionally, the rotational techniques that we see at the end of most goju ryukata are very similar to the way that action movie stars pretend to snap necks, so that sort of idea for interpretation has a little bit of a surface level appeal. Now, a solid punch to the head will, in most cases, probably end a fight. If you properly connect it, it can knock someone just straight out, and if you've already grabbed onto their head, for instance in a single collar tie, you can do some legitimate damage to their face. But since it's not strictly speaking a lethal technique, it got overlooked as a potential application of this technique, even though that straight punch is also much more likely to snap someone's neck than really almost any neck crank. I personally also don't interpret the straight punch in that section of Saifa as being a punch either, or rather not as really only being a punch. The way that it remains extended, and the fact that that left hand turns almost immediately into a palm block, leads me to suspect that it's intended to help turn around one's opponent as well as to guard against any strikes in order to execute what I think the real finishing technique of that sequence is, a rear choke with the bent right arm. I like my interpretation of this technique for a few reasons. One is that it could work either by forcibly turning the opponent around or by guarding so you can step behind and take their back, both of which interpretations could be supported by the stepping pattern of the kata. Two, it provides an actual reason for the turn. You don't need to rotate yourself around to do a neck crank, but you can only do that type of choke from the back position. And three, somewhat selfishly, my interpretation also lines up reasonably well with the Shodei Khan interpretation of that technique, although theirs generally assumes that you are then taking your opponent to the ground as opposed to just choking them out right there. The assumption of lethality runs throughout all of Giles Hopkins' interpretations of Kata Bunkai, and for that reason, I end up disagreeing with a lot of his conclusions. There are, in fact, probably too many interpretations that I disagree with for me to list now. Instead, I'm going to give just one more example from Super Impe, which I've chosen because I also want to demonstrate that, for all of my talk about disagreeing with his interpretive choice here, I don't actually know that much better either. Super Impe is considered to be the most advanced of Gojudu's kata, and I learned it the most recently out of all of the kata that I know. That means both that I haven't had the chance to analyze it enough to figure out what I think the true meaning is, and also that I haven't had the chance to be taught very much about its bunkai by other people either. So here we go. The sequence that I'm going to be taking a look at is what Giles Hopkins calls the first complete sequence, which begins after the Four Corners Shikodachi sequence. Here's a clip. I'm primarily going to be focusing on the finishing technique of this sequence, which is everything that happens after the front kick. Hopkins' interpretation starts by saying that 
The elbow strike is intended to hit the opponent in the head, while the open hand grabs and controls it. In my opinion, so far so good, since, as he points out, the front kick may have at that point served to unbalance the opponent, which would bring their head to about that height. However, the next technique he interprets as rolling the forearm of the right arm along the neck of the opponent, then grabbing the back of the head or the hair. The final palm strike in this sequence gets rendered, once again, as being a neck break technique. Like I mentioned, I can't give you a more convincing interpretation, because I haven't yet reached an interpretation that I'm satisfied with. Yet there are a few problems that remain that make me question this particular analysis. First, we've already been over the fact that neck breaks don't really work. But more than just that, this interpretation doesn't, in my opinion, adequately explain the fact that the kata really doesn't indicate any sort of hair grabbing technique. Here Hopkins is taking the fact that the hand ends up at about head height in order to assert that the hair is grabbed, and he dismisses the more common interpretation that this shows a back fist strike to the face. But the justification for the more common interpretation is just the same as his, that the hand seems to be in that sort of position. Finally, if the technique were, as he's claiming, a neck crank, I would personally expect the left palm to be facing upwards so as to better grasp the chin. I have not seen this kata practice that way, and Mr. Hopkins certainly seems not to be altering his hand position in the solo kata either. I don't know what a better interpretation would be, but I am sure that there's something missing from this one. In this section, I've primarily focused on examples where Hopkins' interpretive framework causes him to see neck cranks, specifically because neck cranks are the kind of technique that seem to be lethal but really aren't, undermining most of his argument. There are some examples where he suggests more truly lethal techniques, for instance, such as his interpretation of kururumfa as having an ippon seoin nage, which is an interpretation that I agree with, which, depending on the recipient's ability to break fall and the surface that they're being thrown on, could very easily, as we've seen, result in death or permanent injury. Furthermore, there are a few of his analyses where he proposes a more non-lethal technique, such as a guillotine choke. Although I will freely admit that, like all chokes, it could, if you held it for some time, become more lethal as a finish. In general, though, there really aren't that many truly lethal techniques in goju kata, or in any style for that matter. At the end of the day, this really all comes back to whether more effective means more lethal, and I just don't think that it does. And while most of the lethal interpretations of goju kata that he proposes seem feasible, if nothing else, I think that it's much simpler to just assume that sometimes a punch is just a punch, and that not every technique has to lead to death. Despite his fixation on lethal finishing techniques, I think that the vast majority of Giles Hopkins' analyses of goju ryu kata are, if not 100% correct, then at least very sensible and onto the right idea. His analytical method has one thing which almost every other method I've seen lacks, an understanding that kata techniques are sequences of response, not just single techniques. I personally really love this feature of his analysis because it makes a lot more sense to me to break Saifa into just three or four distinct drills, for example, than it does to try and count the number of individual techniques and interpret them each on their own, just completely out of context. The Kaisai no Genri includes this idea to some degree, but even so, the Kiso Kumite sets, which Toguchi developed based on his analysis of the Koryu Kata, seem to interpret Kata moves one at a time, as well as in a slightly stilted manner that really doesn't remind me of the reality-based drills that his own theory supposes to be the ultimate origins of Kata. Karate was, in all likelihood, never intended to be lethal, at least not in the sense that we think of it today. As a martial art of personal protection, there was really no need for practitioners to assume that they would ever have to take a life, and every reason to suspect that, should they truly need to, it could be accomplished after the attacker had been rendered unconscious, immobile, or otherwise unable to defend themselves. And the need for lethal techniques is even further decreased in modern martial arts, where the fact that we live in societies governed by laws means that the combatant who kills, even in self-defense, faces a steep challenge in proving to a jury that it was indeed a necessary and proportional response. 
If we go looking for fatalities in our kata, we can probably find some, but they'll always be a stretch. And I think that our interpretations of kata will fare a lot better if we abandon that particular criterion for something a little bit more likely. Thank you all for watching this video, and especially thank you to my patrons, since I'm sure YouTube's monetization won't be a big fan of the fact that I used words like lethal, killing, and death in this script. An extra special thanks, as always, goes out to Stefan Sandberg, my Greenbelt tier patron, and of course to Giles Hopkins, who is sort of one of the indirect reasons why I started this channel in the first place. I hope that I wasn't too harsh. If you liked this video, then there's a like button that you can press, as you're well aware, and if you really liked it, or if you really didn't, then there's a comment box where you can tell me why my interpretation of Sypha specifically is wrong and just, you know, ignore everything else that I said in this video. If you too would like to help me purchase and analyze books like this in the future, then you can go to my Patreon and pledge me some money, which gets your name in the credits, as well as a couple of other things. As always, links to my sources, as well as to my Patreon, are going to be in the video description so that you don't have to Google them all for yourself. Until next time, I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and go snap some spines. Ow. Please don't actually do that.